Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. We're really happy to invite you here and, and have you here at the State Department for our second uh, Women in Foreign Policy convening. We started this series because we really wanted to bring together experts and practitioners and policymakers to talk about the different challenges um, that women are facing and what, what sh what's working. And that's really what we're interested in. And how the key for us really is how can what's happening out in the field inform what we're doing in terms of policy development and diplomacy. So we're excited. Our first, our first was on adolescent girls, and our second now is obviously on, on women in elections and trying to understand that better. And we have a whole list of these that we're going to continue to do. So thank you all so much for being here. So with more than 70 elections happening around the world this year, it really is an ideal time for us to look at women in elections. And if there was any doubt that this issue is worth our attention, there was an interesting moment last week, I'm sure many of you saw this, that made it clear that women in elections are an important topic. I'm talking about a sketch on the Jimmy Kimmel show. I don't know if any of you saw that. Uh, it was quite something to see. Um, Kimmel sat down with two boys and two girls, and he asked them what they thought about the idea of a woman running for president. Did anyone see this? It's obviously a timely topic for us because we have two candidates, one in each party uh, who is a woman. So that's made it more interesting and he had Secretary Clinton on there. But I wanted to read to you a couple of the quotes from that, from the, from the comments that the kids made. Kimmel asked them to name a woman president and they were all very quick to say there isn't, isn't one, has never been one. But then one of the boys, it was about maybe 12, it's hard to say, but says that women can't be president because they're too girly and they would paint the White House pink. Like, okay. <laughs> Then he asked them if women can do anything men can do, and the girls are quick to say yes, and the boys are quick to say no, they can't because women are too weak. Finally, Kimmel asked them what would happen if a woman president ran a war, and the boys say she would lose and she would be scared, um, but one of the girls, perhaps intuitively understanding the importance of the women, peace, and security agenda, even at her age, <laughs> says that a woman president would make the war stop so people could be healthier and they wouldn't die. Okay, so who knows how these kids were prompted, how the piece was edited, we really don't know. It was funny in a way, but at the same time it was a little discouraging. Um, the girls were on board with women in politics and the boys seemed to already harbor some of the stereotypes that hold women back from fully participating. The numbers suggest that these kids aren't alone. Although women make up 50% of the world's population, obviously, only about 24 out of more than 300 uh, women leaders serve as either heads of state or heads of their government. Just 22% of parliamentarians are women, and less than 20% of government ministers are women, with the majority serving in the fields of education and health. These numbers are low in the U.S. as well. Here we have 20% women in Congress, 18% of mayors, and 12% of governors, so it's low even in the U.S. Across the globe, these are the leaders who will make the critical decisions that affect all of us in the future. And simply put, there just are not enough women in these jobs. That's not to say we haven't seen progress. We have, both here in the U.S. and in countries around the world. There are more women in elected office now than ever before, but the numbers are still unacceptably low. And for me, the question is why? You know, how can we try to address it if we don't understand what's happening here? So this morning, we have two incredible women parliamentarians who are are here to share their experiences as candidates and as elected officials. Um, but women as candidates, that's really just one piece of the puzzle here. We've seen in the United States how women as voters are also tremendously important. When women are taken seriously as candidates in political parties, the issues that they care about are taken seriously as well. There's a reason that President Obama signed the Lilly Ledbetter Act as his first act in, in, uh, in office, and it's because elected officials understand the power of women, and President Obama really wanted to signal how important that is. The truth is that women leaders often raise issues that have been typically overlooked by others. They have a reach to marginalized groups, and they have a unique knowledge that stems from their roles, their responsibilities, and their experiences in society. It seems obvious to all of us, I think. They can have a real impact on the issues that we care about, empowering women in the economy, ensuring girls go to school, and promoting peace and stability in communities and countries. In societies with strong, inclusive democracies, we are more likely to see peaceful transfers of power instead of violent struggles for control. We see strong rule of law and equal opportunity instead of impunity and corruption. We see good public policy that promotes progress, and for the United States, we see allies and partners that can help advance global peace, security, and prosperity. 
So from a foreign policy perspective, women in elections are critical. Their voices as voters and as candidates need to be valued and heard. But for that to happen, we need women to be engaged in all parts of the political process. And right now, there are far too many barriers that are limiting them from participating in their countries around the world. In many places, women can't vote if there aren't women observers or election workers who can staff and monitor polling places segregated by gender. Or women can't vote if gender-based violence during elections keeps them at home. And women can't run if their community frowns upon women playing leadership roles. Or, as we've even seen in some places, their political parties demand that they pay to play with sex, which is quite horrifying. The good news is that many people are working to address these problems. Today we have a great panel of experts here to talk about the barriers, the solutions, and the next steps we see, and they see, in women's political participation. But before we get to that, we have a very special guest who's going to present a short clip from a documentary called The Supreme Price, which tells the story of a mother and daughter working to raise the voices of women in Nigeria. So please join me in welcoming the Executive Director of Women Make Movies, Deborah Zimmerman. Thank you so much, Ambassador Russell. I'm completely thrilled to be here, um, and particularly thrilled to be here this week, um, because my work took me to Myanmar this summer, uh, and I had the opportunity to serve on the jury of a nascent uh, human rights film festival, and was able to give the Asang Suu Kyi Prize to the best documentary, so um, on her 70th birthday. So I'm very happy this week to, to be here, and to, um, in a week when, uh, Myanmar has achieved such a striking victory for democracy. Um, as Ambassador Russell said, I'm the executive director of Women Make Movies. I've been doing that for actually more than 30 years. Uh, and in those 30 years, I've seen an extraordinary rise uh, of women filmmakers, though we have a long, long way to go. I think our numbers are about equal to the governors, um, less than women in Congress, um, which is pretty depressing. Um, but Women Make Movies has served uh, as a focal point to increase the number of women documentarians working here in the U.S. and abroad. From our humble beginnings in a church basement in 1972 in New York City, uh, Women Make Movies, a nonprofit social enterprise, has grown into the largest distributor of independent films by and about women. We're very proud that films from Women Make Movies have won or been nominated for Academy Awards in nine of the last 10 years, we're hoping this year again, uh, including Saving Face, uh, which earned Pakistan its first Academy Award uh, for a film about acid burning by Charmin Ch uh, Obeid Chinoy. Our collection of more than 600 films shine a light on the most pressing issues and concern face concerns facing women in their neighborhoods, in our cities, across the nation, and indeed around the globe including violence against women, immigrant issues, health concerns, racial equality, labor issues, girls' education, and in general, women's social, economic, and of course, political empowerment. Our films provide inspiration and empowerment to those whose voices are seldom heard, and at the same time challenge assumptions, provide new perspectives, and educate the public on women's lives. Through our production assistance program, we assist women filmmakers to get their vision and voices on the screen through the production of their films. And in the last three years, we've helped women raise more than $15 million to uh, fund those productions. One of those films is the film that you're about to see uh, a short excerpt from, The Supreme Price. The Supreme Price is one of a dozen of films in a collection from Women Make Movies called Leadership and Politics, uh, Run, Women, Run. The films honor the women's, accomplish women's accomplishments in public office, including profiles of Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman to run for president, Patsy Mink, the first woman of color in Congress and one of the creators of Title IX, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the first woman elected head of state in Africa, and New Zealander Georgiana Bayer, the first elected transgendered person to hold office. We're very proud of all the films in the collection, but maybe none more so than The Supreme Price. It's an extraordinary film about an extraordinary woman, Hafsat Abiola. The film, A Labor of Love by filmmaker Joanna Lipper is a great example of what women can do when we commit to empowering women in the public sphere. Joanna, a photographer, author, and filmmaker, met Hafsat Abiola when they were both students at Harvard. Years later, Joanna committed to telling her life story. 
The film traces the evolution of the pro-democracy movement in Nigeria and efforts to increase the participation of women in leadership roles. Following the annulment of her father's victory in, Nigeria, in the Nigerian presidential elections and her mother's assassination by agents of the military dictatorship, Hafsat Abiola faced the challenge of transforming a corrupt culture of governance into a democracy capable of serving some of Nigeria's most needy women. Lipper wanted to make a film that honored the personal and professional sacrifices that Kudarat and other women activists, Kudarat is her mother, uh, make on a daily basis as agents of change in Ni Nigeria. For these women, entering the public sphere and speaking out against the government requires the courage to fight against the deeply entrenched cultural, religious, and political norms, often with se severe repercussions, including arrest, incarceration, and in the most extreme cases, death. Hafsat's courage to do the work she does to empower and give women a voice, and Joanna's commitment to providing a spotlight on that work, using the media to create a heightened awareness of the power of the change is the reason we do what we do at Women Make Movies. What you're going to see is not the complete film, but a short 10 minute excerpt, which was commissioned to launch Gucci's Chime for Change Women's Empowerment Campaign at TED 2013. The film has been seen global, this short excerpt has been seen globally on the internet. The complete film is screened in festivals around the world and is in the libraries of hundreds of colleges and universities. It's screened throughout Europe as part of Cine ONU, one of the UN's most successful outreach initiatives, and has been broadcast in 49 countries across sub-Saharan Africa a doc, uh, through, Af through AfriDocs, a satellite documentary channel. As Hafsat herself has said, Peace comes from being able to contribute the best that we have and that we all are towards creating a world that supports everyone. But is all, it is also securing the space for others to contribute the best that they have and all that they are. This has become the motto for us at Women Make Movies. I believe that all of us who are committed to supporting and expanding women's role in the public sphere as leaders and change agents are doing just that, creating that space. I hope you enjoy the film. In 1993, my father was elected president of Nigeria. He came with a platform that said, hope farewell to poverty. his opponent, hands down, everywhere. The military annulled the election within the month of his victory. They didn't want a democratic system. When I was appointed by Bill Clinton as ambassador, I had expected that I would be presenting my, my credentials to Abiola, and instead there was a military coup that brought General Abacha into power. Long live the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The compound was completely surrounded by police guards looking for my dad. His most recent actions of declaring himself the president and commander-in-chief of the armed forces led to his arrest by the law enforcement agents. They put my father in jail in 1994. And that was when my mother became the leader of the pro-democracy movement. Ms. Saviola, what do you think threatened America to be doing? First and foremost, they should embargo the oil. Second, they should freeze the accounts of these military rulers and politicians. We depended very much on Nigeria for oil. There was a reluctance to rock the boat. 
my mother organized many protests against the military, including the oil workers' union strike. She told us that she's fanatically committed to the annulment of the June 12th election results, and that if need be, if she has to pay the supreme price, she will defend that mandate. My mother's phone was tapped by the military. Every movement that she was making was being tracked. to the tire so that the driver could not drive. And he turned back and he saw my mom's head like this. She had been shot through the head. journey to the ancestral place and I heard her thinking I don't need to stop I don't need to turn around Asad knows what to do so she was that Kudirat has told us if she dies in the process Hafsa that will step in her shoes and she knows she will not disappoint us the military leader who had had my mother assassinated, who had had my father incarcerated, died mysteriously. At the time that they were to release my father, the military announced that he died in jail. I believe that my father was killed. I returned to Nigeria in 1999, within days of the military transfer to civilian rule. I hadn't been home in a very long time. Aren't you worried that they turned you into a target for the Nigerian government? Aren't you worried about your safety? I think I'm a target if I do not speak out. I moved into my mother's bedroom. Nobody had lived there since she had been killed. The trial began into her assassination. Mohammed Abacha, the son of the military dictator, was charged with killing my mother. But the judge mysteriously said that the man had nothing to answer for and acquitted him. So he's free now. For the other two defendants, it was not going to be as easy for them to escape justice. So they kept stalling the case for many, many years, hoping that in time, people would forget the details of the crime that was committed. At that point, I lost all faith in the judicial process. It became clear to me that people were not only forgetting my mother, who was killed in the course of the struggle, they were just forgetting all the women who had played a key role in demanding freedom and an end to military rule. I looked around at the government that came into power following a long and bitter struggle for democracy. And I saw a government that was over 98% men. Their concerns predominate in legislation. One Nigerian woman dies every 10 minutes <laughs> from complications in pregnancy and childbirth. newborns die daily. We have a government that doesn't recognize our needs, that doesn't recognize our rights, that doesn't recognize women. 
this situation is unacceptable. If women do not come out to speak and demand that their lives be valued, it will continue. Nothing will change. I want to empower the strongest voices for change as soon as possible. And so I created KIND, Todoret Initiative for Democracy. I think some of us women have a degree without even attending a school. That is a PhD. That is the puller down syndrome. <laughs> they will want to pull you down by all means. She's right. Pull her down syndrome. I mean, most women have it. But that's not the way it should be when you see someone who can influence your environment, your society, your beliefs positively. You should work with her. Because if she's uplifted, she's uplifting you, she's uplifting the nation. So let us all hold hands. Together we can. Together we, we can. <laughs> no, because we may be looking at the next uh, governor of Lagos State right across from us. Amen. <laughs> you know, and she's not in five years. We don't know what ten years will bring. My mother made the ultimate sacrifice. And I don't doubt that many more women will have to pay a price. But I do not think that we have any other option. Because any society that is silencing its women has no future. I just wanted to say that um, there's some flyers over there uh, about the collection of films on women in elected office, uh, if you're interested. And thank you so much again, Ambassador Russell, for having me speak. I'll just take my computer. I'll leave here. Yeah, I just didn't want to leave it open because <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. That It's interesting because, you know, when we look at our political system, obviously lots of challenges and um, interesting things going on, but when you see the sacrifices that people, women in particular, around the world are making to try to have a voice, it is truly amazing. So in any case, thank you so much for showing that. I really appreciate it. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna introduce the panel and if you all could come up as I introduce you, that would be great and take a seat. And then I'm gonna, I've, I've got a few questions to ask, but we also would be grateful or willing to listen to questions from anybody in the audience. So if you wanna sort of think about that as we go, that would be great. Let's start with Michelle. Michelle Beckering is the Director of Governance at the International Republican Institute, where she previously served as the Director for Women's Democracy Network. So you can come I know it's challenging here. <laughs> Sandra Peppera is the Director for Gender, Women, and Democracy at the National Democratic Institute. <laughs> Sandra joined uh, NDI after 18 years in international development and diplomacy, including 13 years as the UK's Director for International Development. Nahid Farid uh, was elected to the Afghan Parliament in 2010 at the age of 27. I definitely wasn't doing anything nearly that impressive <laughs> at that age, <laughs> making her the youngest. <laughs> Nahid is the youngest MP in Afghanistan's history. She's an advocate for the interests of women and children and serves on the International Relations Committee. And finally, Saida Wanisi, who is a congresswoman in the Tunisian Parliament, where she represents a moderate Islamist party. So, thank you all. So, Sandra, I'm gonna start with you. I'm gonna come sit down, but I just wanted to start with you so you can think about this question. You've worked in places where intimidation and violence, like we've seen here in elections, is all too common. Um, have you seen that the violence is ever gender-based? That's the first question. And what can we do to ensure that women are able to participate fully, freely, in, in free elections? Thank you very much, Ambassador Russell, and good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great that you've started with actually, at some level, one of the most important questions that we're dealing with right now. 
even as uh, Kudrat Abiola and Afshat Abiola's own uh, sacrifices have shown, and I'm sure the ladies on the panel today will also have interesting stories about what they've overcome in order to take up the ultimate role as people's representatives in their countries. The first thing we have to acknowledge is that there is a competitive element to politics. We understand that. It's rough and tumble for everybody, everywhere. There is also political violence in the political environment that impacts women and men in different ways. But beyond that, there is gender-based political violence. So we're looking at something that is actually quite a complex phenomenon. And I think if I could give you one quick example to illustrate what I'm saying. We had a news report about, I think, 10 days ago from Uganda, where they're going through a fairly competitive political period leading up to elections in early next year. And what happened? So the opposition political party went out for a rally, men and women alike, leading women uh, within that group. And they were engaging, let's put it that way, with the police uh, force at the same time. So, you know, there was a lot of backwards and forwards. There were some physical assaults going on, both of the men and the women. That is political violence that may have a differentiated impact on the men and the women. But then, the woman was stripped naked. That is gender-based violence because the men weren't stripped. And as we all know, in any culture we want to name, the undressing of a woman in public is absolutely about the fact that she is female. It's got nothing else to do with anything else. So we have to acknowledge this. We have to name it. We have to own it. And then we begin to address it. Uh, and it's not going to be easy. But at first, I think the first step, uh, if I may say, is just we need to acknowledge that there is political violence that differentiates between women and men, and then there is gender-based political violence. And we have to be ready to deal with all those things. That's a good question, and first of all, thank you very much for having me here today, um, and it is such a pleasure to be with my honorable colleagues here, um, especially a dear friend, Nahid, who uh, better than I can really talk about the challenges of uh, women in politics. But getting back to the question, so what are, uh, you know, first we can talk about really quickly, what are the challenges? Well, the challenges are, are widespread, um, and some have to do with very technical issues. If we have women, wanting to run for office, what are some of the barriers? Well, first of all, we have to look at the political systems where women are running. Oftentimes, these are entrenched. They are male-dominated political parties. I think here in the United States, we would even understand that. And are there entrees for women even to be involved in the political party? Look at the candidate lists that come out nowadays. Who's designing the candidate list? Well, it's the male party leaders. So, you know, who's the gatekeeper? Again, we have to look at, first of all, how do we get women into the entree points? What are the ways in? So through IRI, our programming is structured in a three-fold system. We would say our, our motto is, we want to empower women to not only political participation, but political leadership. And obviously, a key example of that is women being elected to office. So it's a three-pronged approach. What we can't do is overlook that entry level. It is really hard to go into a country where women have no education, they have no financial independence, and say, well, things would be better if you just ran for office. This is not even something on their radar. So we start with political sort of education, working with women to first of all understand, do you know you have rights under the law? 
Some of them don't even, aren't even registered to vote. Some of them wouldn't even know where to vote if they could vote. We start there, we start at the base level, making sure women can be a part of this. Then you have the next level up. There's women who want to be involved. We work with them to help them become active in political parties. We'll have a women academies where we actually introduce them to the different political parties in their area and have them meet with some of these party leaders to see how they might become involved. The next step is women in, in campaigns, and, and this is something that I feel very strongly with. When we get a very brave, a very strong woman to say, okay, I will run, does she have the support necessary to run? First of all, is she being taken seriously by the party? Does, you know, is she on um, a candidate list at a certain level where she may actually get elected? She's not just at the bottom of the list. Second, it takes a lot of education for anyone to run. When we're working with women candidates, we say your, the key here is that you can be different than all the male candidates that came before. You know specifically what are the issues facing families, what are facing other women, and more than that, everyone in your local community, in your society. So we help them with basic education on how to run an issue-based, not personality-based campaign. And then the third aspect of that is working with women who've been elected. A lot of our members over the years through our programming have said this is where a lot of times they sort of feel like they get left off. We get them elected and then we're like, congratulations, see you in five years. That's problematic. That's where, and I again don't want to speak for my esteemed colleagues, that's where we have to come in. First of all, it's one thing to be elected. A lot of the countries where I've worked, women don't even know what their basic responsibilities are. And so it's teaching them, it's doing technical trainings. What is the role and responsibility of a legislature, legislator? And then second, it's helping them build communities of support. In, as you mentioned, the statistics earlier are sobering. So when you have women who are, let's say 30% or less, because the majority of the world's population um, are, are legislators are actually well below the 30% of women's representation, let's help them coalition build. Let's do that not only within the parliament, through women's committees, through bipartisan women's caucuses, but let's do it outside. One of, I think, the great examples of this has been WDN's country chapters. These are non-governmental organizations that are developed with women from business, from civil society, and from politics. And one of their greatest strengths is they work together to actually support the women who are in office. Um, and we find that has been a very helpful strategy. Thank you very much. It's interesting. Um, when, you know, when I travel, I meet with women parliamentarians, legislators all around the world, and I, I find that I have my, I, my own sort of bias, which is when they're not spectacular, I'm really upset. You know, if, and I think, okay, well, there are mediocre politicians everywhere in the world, so why do I hold women to this higher standard? But I clearly do because I feel like they, so much is riding on their shoulders, but a key part of that is making sure that they have the tools that they need to do the job well. Um, so we have two exceptional uh, political figures here. Um, Saida, I'd like to start with you and, and just ask you a little bit about, perhaps you could respond. I, I was grateful that both uh, our first speakers sort of set up the kind of context of what's going on for women around the world. But I'm particularly interested in Tunisia and the, the sort of perception that it's a success story because politicians and political figures are willing to compromise. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the role of women in that context. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, thank you all of you to, to be here and thank you for the great opportunity. Uh, indeed, Tunisia is a bit different for, from other countries and especially in the region um, because first of all, we do have a kind of um, historical pattern which explain why in a country which was um, very open to other cultures and also very connected to, uh, to, to, to other parts of, uh, of, uh, of the world, um, that actually we were quite um, open to um, uh, update our uh, legislation very early, straight after the independence of, uh, of Tunisia. Um, it was a bit, let's say, uh, um, autocratic uh, from, uh, from the beginning, but 
President Bourguiba decided in a very uh, uniform way uh, that Tunisia will be a pro-women uh, country and uh, to give them rights. So um, our personal uh, statute code, which is basically the, the civil code of Tunisia, uh, would from the beginning say uh, that women and men are equal before the, before the law. Um, and um, so uh, polygamy, for example, was forbidden. Uh, you know, uh, women uh, had the right to work, uh, had the right to work without asking for an authorization, had the, also the economic uh, uh, independence. All this was in the law. In reality, it was very different. Uh, but um, I would say that we had, uh, from uh, the 50s, a lot of women organizations, very different uh, from the secularist part, from the Islamist part, who started to do this important job of pedagogy uh, um, among women and, uh, and directed to women, so they actually understand their rights. As you say uh, very clearly, um, you can have countries, and especially developing countries with a very uh, you know, pro-women uh, legislation, but from the moment it is not uh, a reality uh, in the society, and from the moment women, they don't endorse that themselves and feel that it is theirs, um, it's not working. So um, women here, um, we, we did something which is great, and I think even other you know, countries, and <laughs> I'm thinking sometimes about also the US, uh, we adopted the principle of parity in the law in our first democratic elections. And that was a kind of uh, no choice for it. Th there is no any political party uh, who could come publicly and say, no, we are against it. So uh, we imposed by the law the presence of women in the lists. So 2011, we had 40% of uh, the Constitutional Assembly which was composed of women. And this experience, when we were writing the new electoral law for the 2014 elections, um, it was a kind of basic for us. So nobody came to discuss the principle of parity here. And this is actually what helped us to have uh, about 36% of uh, women in parliament in this new, uh, uh, this new assembly. And myself, I was a head of list in a very important constituency. And I was before a previous minister. And uh, you know, um, I mean, it was a kind of sign uh, to uh, to the Tunisian society that young women can make it, and they can even lead a list where there is, you know, um, uh, let's say, uh, senior political leaders, and that they, we can do the job properly. So there was a lot of pressure on us, I would say, but in the same time, um, we, we're trying to be exceptional, but we also. <laughs> We also, in the same time, advocating for uh, equal mediocrity. <laughs> yeah, I would say. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Nahid, I, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit. I mean, Afghanistan has been the focus of so much attention. Obviously, we in the United States are so committed to women succeeding, doing well, continuing to participate there. We see every day the challenges that women in Afghanistan continue to face, but also see how many women have kind of really taken hold of opportunities. And when I go there, I meet all sorts of political leaders and also women in business, women in journalism. It's truly amazing to see the difference in that country. But obviously, we recognize the continuing challenges. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your role with social media and what how you've seen that kind of play out in Afghanistan, whether it's helpful, powerful, and Um, thank you, Ambassador Rassel, for having me here, and I'm so glad that I could make it. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to speak here on behalf of Afghan women. Um, I will start with two stories about myself, and then I will go to your question, because I think this, this story will give you a picture about what's going on in Afghanistan. And the, the first story is about the time I was, um, I was running for office back in 2010. Uh, one day, um, an incumbent um, candidate who was a member of the parliament for five years came to our house and asked for my father-in-law um, to, to uh, quit my campaign. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason that he had 
was that the parliament is a, is a place of defame for women. That's a place, that's a very dirty picture of women representation there. And you are having such a reputation in this community. How are you going to send your daughter-in-law to the parliament? And my father-in-law just um, pushed him back and he said that my, my uh, daughter-in-law is different and I'm going to continue financing her campaign and helping and supporting her. But uh, this, this story can tell us that someday uh, a male uh, supporter of a candidate quits and that woman cannot continue. Uh, another story that I want to tell you is the 30, 30, 30 day, the 30th day of the campaign that I had. I had 58 days campaign, and I remember every minute of it because, because every every minute had a story and a different uh, perspective of the society that I was r running inside of it. On that um, the, the day of 30, uh, I received that news that five. Uh, Mm, campaigners of a female competitor uh, was beheaded. And uh, after beheading, um, they sent the body to the city. And that day, I decided not to send my campaigners outside of the city and I started working with media inside of the city. That's why I got all the votes from within the city, not from outside. And this means uh, um, if you are running, you have to give sacrifice for yourself and also for the people around you. All those people, all those uh, boys and girls that have family and have a bright future and they have a lot of dreams and they are going to uh, be in danger as well as you. And this two story um, and a lot of other stories and not just my, my story, the story of a lot of women who are running for, for office, but uh, I, could, I could get elected on that election. Fortunately, people uh, sent me to the Parliament of Afghanistan, and it's like five years that I'm there. Um, uh, according to the to the subject of the um, issue that we are speaking about uh, today, from a statistic point of view, as Ambassador Russell also mentioned, we have to ask the question from ourselves: How many um, women are in elected office in the parliaments of the world? Although they are 50 percent of the population of the world. And uh, according to the statistic that it's kind of the same, is 22 percent, uh, although we are like 51 percent of the population, just 22 percent of women are representing. And the, the meaning of election, if you're defining election, you have to find out what does it mean. The meaning is inclusiveness, having all people heard. In the, in the politics, but we are not heard in the politics because just 22% of us are in the parliament. And the other um, uh, angle of the issue is that in, in my parliament, we have 23% um, of quota or reserve seats. Without those reserve seats, we wouldn't make it. We cannot go to the parliament. And in, when we are in the parliament, our male co um, colleagues always tell us that without Kute, without those reserves in the Constitution, you wouldn't be here. You belong home. That's the reason that you are here. Because people didn't vote you. Be because people can't elect you. People, people just elect us, they don't elect you. And that's a fact, really. Without the election, I mean, I got 6,000 votes. A man in my society got 30, 36,000 votes. It's a large difference. How can I get that large difference with, with the resource and time and money and, and the allies that I have? Um, and and the, the, the issue of the sex, the biological difference, and all this uh, gender issue is, um, and the social meaning given to this, uh, the, uh, in, in my community, in my country, uh, made the, the representation of women is so difficult, so the vote is so bumpy in front of us. And the, the greater you go, if you're running for that out of quota se uh, seat, the, the, the greatest the bump is in front of you. Um, about the, the role of social media, um, technology changed the life of every everybody in this world. And in Afghanistan, social media is real. You can express yourself without any mediator. You can reach to your um, a constituency without any problem, and I use this. Um, I have uh, 300,000 followers in my uh, Facebook page, and Facebook uh, is much more uh, popular in Afghanistan than Twitter. Um, 
Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, who is the CEO, uh, has 500,000. I'm 200,000 <laughs> short, it's all right, but I will, maybe one day that I become the prime minister, I will have that uh, 500,000. But right now, I think if, if you uh, compare, it's a lot, a lot of follower. And, and through that, you can mobilize people, you can bring in people even to the, to the uh, street for demonstration, and through that, you can report to the people that People, we did this in the parliament today. We had this speech. We have, we had this um, uh, gathering. We had this um, accomplishment. We could pass this um, legislative legislation in the parliament, or we couldn't because of this and that. And that's very, very good. I mean, um, maybe without that, uh, I wouldn't have all this. Um, as I, as I list for myself, a lot of accomplishments that I have uh, wouldn't be possible without social media. So that role is very important in a, in, in a political life in Afghanistan. Thank you, Nahid. I, you raised so many important points in your comments about the importance of us working with men and boys, which is something that we're always mindful of because sometimes we're so focused on women that we, we don't always remember that we've got to bring the men and boys along to, to be a part of the discussion. And also, I, I was intrigued by that point you made about kind of the burden that you feel as a candidate for those who are around you in, in terms of violence. And that's a really important point that we need to keep in mind, so I appreciate that. The other thing I, I would say is that, and I think that um, sort of all of you have made this point in a different way, but that we're looking at women and elections, but this is, a, this is all part of a much bigger challenge, right? Which is, and this is, I say this all the time about just the issues that we work on, that really the challenge is trying to raise the status of women and girls in countries. And that is ultimately a challenge for all of us because when women aren't regarded well and you know you have to find champions, you have to find people who believe in this, like your father-in-law. Um, but overall, we have to make sure that girls are educated, that women have health care. All of these pieces need to come in, into play. Um, Sandra, I wonder if you could talk just for a minute about Nahid's point on social media and what you're seeing in other campaigns around the world and sort of the use of social media, particularly by women. The, I, I think there's a lot more to be done in this area. Um, but carefully, and I think Nahid makes a you know, really strong and important point about how she's able to use it in the context of a society where, if you like, the, the physical presence is somewhat constrained. But we need to understand a couple of things. First of all, it is still the case that women are 14% less likely to own a mobile phone than men. Uh, the gender gap on technology in Sub-Saharan Africa 68% of women in Sub-Saharan Africa do not have mobile phones, let alone access to <coughs> smartphones and the web and internet, exactly. So I think you know, careful analysis of the infrastructure is very important. The other part about it is, I think, also um, that we, social media technology is a bit of a mirror on ourselves. So everything that happens in the physical world happens online. Uh, when we, uh, the GSMA, the Association of Mobile Phone Operators, they did a study and they pointed out that access and security and cost were still the three biggest issues for women to have online presences. Access, security, and cost. That's no different to when there was no internet and women were trying to run for, for politics. The second part about it, of course, is that in the area of violence, uh, and uh, harassment and discrimination, we know that this is a media that actually accelerates that, amplifies it. What is out in the web can never be retracted. Um, last weekend, or I think actually last month, there was an example of a leading woman in Turkey who had been a minister <laughs> 20 years ago uh, and found a really inappropriate uh, video put back online in the middle of a campaign. Uh, I mean, you know, this is something that is way in the past. I'm sure we've all had those inappropriate moments when we shouldn't have been doing whatever we were doing, but it's able to be amplified and accelerated around the community through the social media front. So yes, it's, it should be a powerful tool to get women's voices out there and to start that process of changing norms, which is really at the heart of all this, is to change the norms 
around inclusion. To, and to recognize that actually, even as women do make it, there's a couple of things. First of all, elections are a snapshot. I think we've all kind of said that. Elections is a snapshot in time. The longer uh, journey is around representation, effectiveness, and influence. And that means that as, uh, as the democracy assistance supporters, we have to stay with women longer. Michelle, you made that point. The second point is that even as women do stand up and step up in all the roles, as voters, as activists, as candidates, as legislators, as observers, some of them have already overcome two or three different exclusions. We were very lucky early on in the summer, uh, Saida will be interested in this, to have a young intern from Tunisia from the African population. You know, she is a minority within a minority within a minority <laughs> in Tunisia, which is doing great things. So even as she stepped up to engage as a young woman activist with youth engagement uh, and a human rights perspective on media and so forth, look at all the barriers she'd already overcome. The good news, I say, is once you see inclusion, it's really difficult to unsee it. But you have to brace open the space. And I think that, that uh, that's something that we can all uh, take part in. And as we said, it's something that media and technology, new ways of engaging citizens with the political system um, are all very important uh, foundations for doing that. Yes, how, uh, recognizing and seeing some of the online harassment, which of women is really horrible sometimes. I, I mean, it is kind of breathtaking, the things that people will say about women who dare to run for office. How do you prepare candidates for that? I mean, it must be just, like, just shocking to them to see what people will say, people who don't even know them. Absolutely, and, and the anonymity mm -hmm. of the web yeah, is, exactly. is, is hugely important. And I think, you know, to the extent that we are engaging with some of the, you know, the big web providers mm -hmm. to really step up uh, and understand some of these issues, it, it, it is key. The, the, the other part of it, though, unfortunately, is, is, is what Nahid was saying, that this can impact on particularly the, the social group around women. You know, we know, uh, actually largely from the United States, that it takes a woman uh, seven requests before she'll step up to be a candidate. Seven different people have to ask her seven different times to step up and be a candidate. Now, there's no man in the world that needs to be asked seven <laughs> times to do anything. Without even asking, they go and do it. Except but, the chore, maybe. But we, we, we have to understand this, this issue about the, relation, uh, the relational pull and the importance of that circle of support to women's engagement. And if you have a father, brother, friend, whatever it is, partner, who is seeing you being traduced constantly, then exactly what Nahid was saying, that removal of support becomes a huge, huge factor. One of the issues in uh, Nigeria, of course, you, you saw the women on that, on that film. There's no shortage of strong, intelligent, impactful women in Nigeria. But a huge barrier is the issue of campaign finance. And without money, you are, if you like, at the mercy of patronage systems which are particularly fraught where women are concerned. Saida, could you talk just for a minute about and, and then maybe in the next, uh, the biggest challenges that you faced and, and what was helpful to you in overcoming them, whether it was training or support from other women or just your own internal resilience or all of those. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think, um, a collaborative process. Um, you're definitely right. I mean, you need to be supported by people uh, who trust you, uh, who are close to you, uh, to actually even start thinking that you can make it and that you actually uh, uh, is equipped enough. 
uh, and that you can be a good politician. So uh, I would say definitely a supportive family is, is essential. Uh, and um, sometimes I'm just thinking how it could be for those who, for example, don't have supporting uh, brothers or fathers or uncles even, because it's something physical. When you go to campaign, you need to enter every single coffee, and sometimes like men coffees, you know, like men only coffees. You need to go, um, you know, on the field. You need to be outside. A lot of people come to touch you, to hug you. To say it's very physical, and you definitely, I mean. Uh, I, I start to believe that the way we do politics today is a very man-oriented way. Uh, the way actually we do very late meetings, the way we are constantly exposed in that we, we can't kind of request, you know, like our private space, we can't just, you know, uh, take time off. You need to be constantly here, and if you're not here, you're going to lose. Your absence is, you know, one of the uh, major uh, uh, things that your uh, masculine colleagues would reproach you afterwards, and they will actually take this occasion to uh, take uh, uh, important decisions when you're not here. So you need constantly to be here and um, um, to say, okay, let's do things differently. Let's adopt another kind of planning or something is, is very, very hard. So here is a, probably for my generation something to work uh, on uh, to kind of introduce new practices, how we, do poli how we do politics differently, how we also interact with people differently. Um, and uh, one of the main challenge is uh, to actually make everybody accept the fact that a woman can do what a man can do. And uh, we won't be worse, uh, we can be better. Uh, we can be equal, like just doing it in the same, in the same exact way. Uh, and, and this is something which is, again, even if the law enable you, uh, mentality of people, just to consider you as something else than just a picture. And this is, I think, one of our main challenge, um, all of us, especially when you're a young woman, like you don't have a lot of things in your career who can speak for you. So people are like, oh, she's cute, that's nice, that's glamorous, actually. So, and uh, especially when you're running for a big party, which is like seen as something serious. So uh, you need to prove constantly that you're not just a picture, that you actually know things that you're talking about, that you have ideas. And um, you know, you need like, it's a kind of, as we say in French, a, a politique de petit pas. So like you're gaining step by step uh, till the moment like people start to consider you as just an equal partner, as someone someone serious. And, but I believe very much that we will be the last generation uh, to do that. And that afterwards, you know, the coming generation will not have to, you know, go again through all this work of just making them understand that we are working in the same team and there is no, you know, like hierarchy between us. I, I just uh, came back from Bangladesh and I had met with some women uh, lawyers and judges and they were telling me, it, it reminded me when you said this about um, meetings at night, that women would say that the, in their, the way their system works, they have the judges sit and the lawyers are all day in court and they have to wait for their cases to come up and then they see clients at night, starting at like five o'clock until 11 o'clock at night. And I said, that makes no sense, right? So it it's obviously doesn't make sense for women. It doesn't really make sense for anybody. If you're trying to meet with your lawyer, you have to meet with your lawyer at eight o'clock at night, it seems preposterous. But it's, the, it's these sort of structural things that are set up without women being part of the process, and then women are struggling trying to accommodate their families and all the other demands on their time, and it means that they can't really participate fully. Um, Mengi, could you talk a little bit about the obstacles that you faced and, and how you overcame those? And I guess I'm sure in Afghanistan, since I have spent a fair bit of time in Afghanistan, the cultural norms are challenging to overcome, and I just wonder how you, how you managed to do that. Um, uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned something that I want to uh, stick the answer to, to what she said about the social media and, and internet and um, the unknown um, users that you don't can track yeah, and you can track them if you don't uh, know them but they are your competitors they are the uh, the people who are against you and they have a lot of information about you and they post it online or they put the pictures that will ruin the future of, of a candidate especially in Afghanistan if a woman um, a, a, a picture of a woman is online that is improper. 
the future of that woman will be ruined. Nobody will vote her. And um, there is no, uh, th that's the, the concept that is in Western countries is a lot different from Afghanistan. One of the challenge I have is when people want to find me in Facebook, it's like tens of, of Nahi Farid there. Yeah. <laughs> and they cannot find who is the real one. Um, another challenge I have is they put uh, the messages that are intimidating me, my family, my daughter, my six years old daughter, that I cannot uh, even put her to kindergarten because of this insecurity and she's at home. And all these challenges, but you know, the greater your goal is, the, biggest you, the bigger your challenges. When we are there and we have a big goal and uh, you know that this is a sacrifice for the next generation, you have to admit that and you have to be a little bit much more strong to, to counter all those challenges. But um, I want to also come to the, to the issue of um, how people look to the, to the candidate who are female. Um, in my uh, society, um, there is a public-private divide uh, of the jobs of women and men. Uh, in public sphere, economy, politics, all the things that are doing outside of the home, all these jobs are men jobs, male dominant jobs, and, and they are fair for, for men, but uh, jobs for home, taking care of women, uh, children, that's a private um, sphere job. And it's public-private jobs, public-private jobs, and all these things, there is this picture that people have about the public-private jobs, uh, hold women back. Okay, these women belong to home. Go take care of your children. Even for me, people say that. Go home, take care of children. Why are you in this administration? You don't have to be here. You don't have children. You don't have house. You don't have a family and all these things. And they, they have this uh, picture. I think the solution, um, and it, it's not a short-term solution, is that we have to change the narrative. We have to find out a game changer. So far, we talked about um, women are victims, women are so poor, women are uh, so um, um, low in um, ability of, of expressing themselves and all these, these things. But we have to shift that narrative to a different one and say that women are leaders. Without women, there is no stability in the society. If we don't have enough uh, women in the politics, we don't have enough representation of 50% of the society. And this narrative, the new narrative, needs new allies. New allies are the people like my father-in-law, the men, men. I think uh, we have to speak to the real mouth. We have to find out ways of having them. Okay, we, we did have a job. We spent a lot of money for uh, bringing, bringing women uh, in front of the society and stepping them up and letting them know uh, their, um, their role in the society. And now they speak up. But uh, still, uh, out of quota, we have just one woman in Afghan parliament. Just one. Out of 68 others came to the quota. Some of them just got 200 votes, 100 votes, 60 votes that they came. So this means we have to uh, bring women and change the narrative and, and uh, have a movement uh, consist of two um, factors. One, men that are, um, uh, that have courage to say that I boldly support my wife. And, be, and, and breaking that ta taboo that we have in some societies, especially in societies like Afghanistan, Tunisia, um, Middle East, and uh, South Asia. And these countries need uh, to, to, to find out a game changer. And game changer are not just women, I think. We have to find out men who are speaking for women, men who are uh, bold enough to come in the society and say bravely that, yes, I put my wife's picture in the public because I want you men to vote her. And uh, this happened to me because uh, in Afghanistan, you can find uh, out, uh, by the way, we cannot find all the statistics, but we can find at least how many men vote you. 
and I could find out that half of the voters were, were male that voted me. So this means without them, I couldn't be a member of the parliament. And we just ignore them and, and uh, we say that you are the people who are um, committing violence against us. But we have men that are supporters and we have to use them as allies. And um, allies are the people who are sitting at the same room. For example, in a room like par parliament, uh, we cannot, we cannot just tell them that you are sidelined, we are the front runners of this, for example, law and legislation, and without them it's impossible to, to just uh, get the position. I think that's exactly right, and I, I loved what you said, that the greater the goal, the bigger the, the challenges, and I think that's something that everyone has to accept internally if they're gonna run for office the way you've done that. It takes a lot of courage to do it. Oh, go ahead. I just want to add something on, on what you just said. Actually, uh, men are also the parliamentarian who vote laws. And for example, in Tunisia at the moment, we working on what we call the integral law, which will look at how we can update our own legislation to make it according to the Constitution, which says very clearly men and women are equal. So we need to review all everything, like family code, civil code, where men and women are not equal, and especially in the sharing responsibility within families. And this will be like a kind of very big legislative marathon, and we need to get as much colleagues as, as, as possible uh, to be pro this integral law so it actually pass. So you can't just you know, like, uh, work to alone. I mean, even them, they need to be educated to, to that. They need to be like, sensitive to, to this kind of progressive laws, uh, which will help to counter violence, uh, and, and especially violence against women in, in, in Tunisia. So uh, we do this internal you know, like work of convincing our own political parties and our masculine colleagues there, and also outside of it, uh, among citizens and, and the rest of, of the society. So it's, it's definitely, maybe this is one of the greatest moves uh, of the feminist movement, or at least in, in Tunisia, which is um, how to be the most inclusive possible and how to make uh, women's rights not being a kind of political question that political parties can be for or against. It's like a general interest question. We, we can take some questions if people have them. I think there are microphones here, so I, I'm going to ask another question, but if you have anything you'd like to ask, feel free to, to get up to one of the, to the microphones. Um, Michelle, the big question in my mind, uh, and Nahid mentioned this, is the question of quotas. Okay? So I'm always asked about that when I travel. Why doesn't the United States have quotas? We have, and and there are, as, as Nahid said, it's a double-edged sword, right? Yes, it's the one way I think we've seen to really up the number of women. Um, but there are challenges about, I think the concept ideally would be that women get in through quotas and then transition, in, right? But we see that that's very difficult in many places. And so it does, um, it gives opponents a, a, a sort of a way to kind of jab at these women to say you wouldn't be here but for a quota. So I guess I, I'm interested in what you think about quotas, how effective they are, is there any alternative, is it kind of the best of the not perfect situation and what have you seen in, in the... <laughs> So I got the easy question. <laughs> no, and it's a great question. And one of the things I found most interesting when I entered the gender field five years ago was the fact that it's such a divisive question and concept among women. Um, so two things I would say. So if you look at the political science theory about it, we look at those we elect to office in one of two camps as either a proxy or a representative. So in countries like the United States where women from both parties are very clear they don't want, um, they wouldn't need a quota, we elect officials on the um, concept of representation. The polling that's been done in the United States would show that there's not actually a gender divide between a man and a woman and if they would vote for a man and a woman. When you ask why, they say, well, it's because I feel that a man could just as equally represent the issues important to me as women. Now we're lucky in the United States, that's because we've come very far and women feel like they have measures of equality. The other sense, and it's a lot of countries, and I think um, not to speak for Afghanistan, but would maybe be more appropriate there as a proxy. These are countries where women's rights are so low, where women's representation, um, are, where women just feel like a man in parliament actually wouldn't either 
choose to represent or tackle the issues that face them or can't. So for instance, these are usually in um, really developing countries where women's equality is very low, you have high maternal mortality rates, et cetera. So they literally, when they are going to vote, think if it's not a woman, she won't be in my place there. And so that's the first thing we have to keep in mind and that's where there's a divide. Now quotas are a fast track, there's no doubt about that. If you look at the countries around the world that have achieved what some in the, again, the gender field would call critical mass, which is about 30%, although even that is, um, generates some sort of conflict of thought, most of those, two thirds of those, have used gender quotas. So we do have to look at the very facts. Now, what is one of the biggest challenges? You talked a little bit about the cons. Now there's ways to um, attend to that. The first is, look at sort of the gender quota system. I think Jordan, um, and there's a lot of countries modeled like this, has one of what I would consider one of sort of the smart uh, gender quota systems, especially for women advocates. Because what's the problem? Men in parliaments, if you have a parliament that doesn't have a gender quota, you look at it as a zero-sum game. If I'm in a parliament of 100, and 80 of us are men, and 20 are women, but they say, let's, let's pass this 50-50 parity. Well, I'm looking at the 50 men next to me, and there's 30 of us who realize we're gonna have to give up a seat. You're not gonna get a gender quota in that system. Where we've seen them really almost most successfully introduced is in countries that have just come out of transition or conflict, right? So because if it was an armed conflict, uh, if it was a revolution in a square, your social and gender barriers have already been shot. You were standing side by side with the men, either it be on a battlefield or in the square, and you are starting from scratch. It's a lot easier than because you're working together to draft this new constitution or this, this new parliament. So getting back to Jordan, Jordan was a parliament that it was already in existence. It wasn't in that other camp. What they did then, because the big, of course, and I'm sure you've heard this, quota women. Quota women aren't real elected officials because they came through a quota. Well, in Jordan, what you have now is 150 members of the parliament. It's, it's kind of complicated because two thirds are elected th through um, single mandate, which we would call you know first past the post, and then about one third are elected through proportional list on um, parties. 12 seats are um, allocated for women, but how they do it is this. It's a competition. They look at, of all of the women candidates, they look at how many um, voters were in their district, how many votes they gained, and then they do a percentage. And then who gets those seats are the top 12 women vote getters. Plus, any woman who has already won her seat by first past the post, and in Jordan, we do have several uh, women who have done that, you now have emphasis, and your party actually has more sort of um, a vested interest in not only supporting women candidates, because as we were talking to some of the party leaders, they're like, well, we know some of these women can win anyway, Plus we've got some women we think could do really well in their district. And they almost look at it as like an advantage because they can get more women and more party members involved. And again, in that situation, it takes away that, oh, you just got you know, given a seat. No, those women had to compete very fairly. So while well, there's pros and cons, and I think it gets back to the second thing we've said, do those women have support once they get there? That's the other thing. So when you have women, um, still 30% is not a lot. You know, are these women able to sort of work together past those party lines to, to get things done? Um, I'm gonna give a quick story. Yesterday I, was, I um, had seen, after about a year, um, a young woman that I had done some training for in Mongolia. And she came to me and we we're talking, she's like, oh, I'm so disappointed with the women parliamentarians. And I said, are you, what? They're rock stars, what are you talking about? She's like, well, we have 12 of them now and I just don't really think they're doing that much for women. I said, okay, first of all, coming from a woman from a partisan country, you have 12 women from five different parties who have started women's caucus. And I said, do you know that amongst them, because I had done some training with the Mongolian women parliamentarians, they actually had come together and said, listen, we're gonna put our parties aside, and any time a woman from our caucus goes to the committee or goes to the floor to introduce legislation, we will unanimously agree, if we've discussed it in the caucus first, to support it. Well, let's be honest. What was their big concern? And they said, we don't want to go with something and fail. There's only 12 of us. We want to show women in Mongolia we are united. What were the first two bills they put forward? Campaign finance reform? Because women in Mongolia, what was their biggest barrier? 
having to pay money to the parties to run. The first thing these women came together on. The second thing was increasing um, uh, a quota for candidate lists. And so I was talking to this young woman, I just said, look what they did. They just hit the two biggest barrier for women getting elected. I said, that was their first step. They wanted to show first anonymity. I think I said that right. Uh, and then they wanted to actually tackle those barriers. It, they knew if the first thing they went in was a very, let's say, you know, controversial, maybe um, an issue that would be consumed, you know, considered really conservative by some of the parties and you know, too radical by the other parties, they would lose. And what would that show women in the country? Nothing. So I think we also have to look at these women and what they're doing. Sometimes it's stepping back and saying, well, it wasn't a really feminist you know, uh, issue that they, they championed. But they work together, and sometimes it's not so obvious what they're doing. And so I think we have to give them a lot of credit for that. Good morning. My name is Kim Weichel, and I, I lead an international women's peace building and leadership organization with a network of women in both Afghanistan and Tunisia. So I have two questions. Uh, firstly, to Michelle and Sandra. Um, is there a research to show the correlation between uh, women as prime ministers, presidents, members of parliament, and the introduction of pro-social policies, pro-education, pro-healthcare, pro-childcare policies, sort of quantitative data, and if so, I'd love to see it. And to our wonderful member, uh, members of parliament, now that you're in parliament, do you find that your voice is heard? Are the women's voices heard and equally included in decision making? Okay, let me start and then I'll give it to Sandra. So on the first issue, one of the things I would make the biggest plea for, I'm taking um, opportunity at the moment, is we, I think, need more funding for research in these areas. Um, and so I'm sorry, Stephanie, I just thought I would make that shout out. Um, because that's important. Um, sometimes it's hard, and especially we haven't seen an aggregate across, um, uh, across the measure. One thing I would say and has been really interesting to me is there is some research coming out now, and I think this is really timely, on gender parity in cabinets. And have those led to an increase? And sometimes we're finding that it's actually been more effective to have more women um, in cabinets and executive levels than necessarily um, just, look, let's say, a head of state or a head of party. Uh, Michelle Bachelet from Chile, whom everyone knows in the women's empowerment uh, community, is one of them. After her first term in office, um, there was some sort of chatter like, well, she didn't really do much to actually on specific social issues. But a lot of actually very gender friendly um, legislation was passed and a lot of other um, legislation that was actually extremely healthy for families, et cetera. So sometimes it's difficult because of the categorization of sort of what we would consider, let's say, um, gender friendly re legislation, et cetera, or if it's if we're just looking at, let's say, social issues. One of the big issues we still have is the party systems. Um, and this is something when you talk with women in caucuses, et cetera, you may have something all women agree with, but we still work in political party systems. And so still, if the majority of, let's say, your cabinet or the parliament that you oversee, um, you know, it depends what kind of political situation it is as well. Do you have that sort of support to get those mandates passed? I absolutely echo that there's just not enough research, but I can sort of give you sort of three pointers. Um, there is an OECD study that s seems to suggest that when you get to a certain critical mass, you have a greater influence and that they will look at much, I think, you know, they're not women's issues, but issues that women have interest in. So that's one. Um, there is a long-term study at the Panchat level in India uh, because they have a reserved seat, 30%, uh, for a long time, and they are seeing two things happening. Yes, increasingly, the, the policies are much more communitarian, they're much more about the community development, uh, water, um, sanitation, roads, and so forth. But the more interesting part about that study seems to suggest that the um, example of women in leadership is changing the ambitions of fathers and mothers for women in leadership, which I think is a very um, a strong uh, uh, indicator. But the, the caveat, I think, always is that, as, as Michelle said, we haven't got enough um, granular research to uh, disaggregate uh, different trends. So you will have a situation whereby a lot of, uh, we, we can say that as economies get stronger, as democracy increases, just the nature of that system 
allows more women to come in and therefore a more inclusive kind of public policy space anyway. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a difficult one and it's our challenge is because there just isn't enough research done on it yet. Saida and Naid, I think the question for you was, are women's voices being heard right. in your city? Um, just on the first question, I, I just want to say that after one year of experience, I just realized that male dom domination is not just the fact of men. I mean, it can be definitely perpetuated by women themselves, and especially those who got inside um, the space and who thinks that, you know, I, I don't know if it's a kind of like reaction of self-protection, so they adopt, you know, male reactions toward women. Um, and especially toward pro-women or gender-friendly legislation, um, uh, especially when it comes to quota, but I mean, even uh, regarding social policies uh, or economic empowerment of, uh, of women. So, um, and, and definitely you can sometimes find your best allies in, in the male you know, group uh, of the parliament or in your political party. And I think political parties here are probably those who get you know, the most important role. And when you have a, a political party who decides, especially for the biggest you know, ones and, and those who are the most influent in, in the political landscape, when they decided themselves to be pro-gender, uh, things evolve quickly. So sometimes it's, it's better to go to your lobby there, uh, whether to go directly to the institutions. For the second question, I would say that um, yes, we heard. Um, but we probably have a double discrimination, uh, us. I mean, I'm 28, so I'm considered as being very young, uh, you know, in, in Tunisia. Uh, so sometimes, like, people listen to you and say, okay, just wait a bit to grow up, and then, you know, <laughs> like, we will take you uh, uh, seriously, and plus, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a woman. But, but I would say that uh, by working hard, and when, I mean, you, you keep trying, and uh, you, you try to be, um, you know, like, uh, very present, do your job, do your homework, uh, you know, try, try to um, kind of fill the role you, you, you have, then, you know, after a certain time, I can say that there is a difference after one year, like, we just celebrated our first year anniversary of, of the election. Um, there, is, there is a move. So I'm, I'm very hopeful uh, that it, it will continue. And myself, for example, I, I'm a member of the Finances Committee, which is a very technical one. And I force myself to take this kind of expert subject to work in just to show that women can speak about economy. I'm, I'm the only member of my parliamentary group who is a member of the Finances Committee, only women member. But to show that like economy, finances, that state budget is not just, you know, like a man thing. It, it's serious, but we can also do it and we can be very good at it. And, and, you know, it's not very, like, uh, mediatic. So you keep, like, you know, working in the kind of, uh, you know, more expertise side, uh, not do a lot of communication, et cetera. So you gain the, the kind of um, a confidence and, and your colleagues trust to, uh, um, um, start to trust you. Uh, so yes, but it's, it's a perpetual, like, journey that we are still in. Um, I would answer also yes, our voice is heard. Um, and uh, within the, the first month that I was elected in, uh, in 2010, I, I could find a way that um, I, I think my people from my province uh, was, was, sac uh, was satisfied that they sent me to the parliament. They were happy, okay, this time we sent a woman that is speaking for us. And uh, still, they are like that. They are so happy that they sent me to the parliament because I started talking about their problems, not only about women, but all, all the issues that are going on from in, in my constituency. And not, and not just only things in the, in the province that I represent, national uh, issues that we um, face every day, we bring it to the hall, to the parliament, and we have like this daily speeches um, um, among uh, women. And um, it's not just about the confidence that we have. We have to be competent as well. We have to have experience. We have to uh, study. We have to have the statistics with us uh, to be heard. And that's why I think a majority of women in the parliament of Afghanistan, they have a good relation with media. And the media is where you, you can connect to the people. And where you speak and people will hear you. Because even if an illiterate woman didn't come out of a home, they have a TV at home. And they, 
they, they watch you. So that's a very good way to connect to your people. And I just want to uh, tell you a story. One day we had an agenda in the parliament that we should keep all this um, representatives of media inside of the hall with this camera or we send them to the media room. And we knew that sending them to media room means censorship. That, that will be just one um, camera and that camera is under the hand of a person who is belonging uh, to a party that we didn't want. So we started uh, talking about we need to have all this media inside of the hall because it's uh, according to the law of access to information. People have to have access to information. There shouldn't be any censorship. Um, and a man stand up and said, no, take them out. Take all this media out. They just take the picture of all these women. They don't take picture of us. And the other one from the other side of the hall said, they put makeup, you know? <laughs> if you don't put makeup, they won't. If you put makeup, then <laughs> and, and he thought, and it was so funny for me because he, he didn't think about what we were saying. <laughs> he was thinking about the picture that is sending to the to the uh, media, and this is a story that um, that I, I brought home, and, and I talked to my family that it happened in the parliament today. But it's not just for makeup. Uh, believe me, uh, many uh, just uh, follow our voice because they think we are speaking from their heart, and and also uh, we are uh, reflecting the pain and hopes about the future of the country. Thank you. Is there a question over here? Yes. My thanks to the panel for telling such a colorful story, and of course it's, it's giving us all a, a vision of what it's really like in the field to do this, but also thanks to everyone who attended, because we're actually the people of interest and influence that are going to be there behind the scenes helping you. I have two points or two questions, and one is, it was touched on very briefly in that touching film. Um, how do we avoid the tall poppy syndrome? And you know, it was portrayed in the news that when President Ghani nominated a female for the court, it was actually the females in parliament who didn't back her all the way. And I'm wondering if that was a factor or were there many factors? We all watched that with great interest. And then my second question is, for those of us that are going out into the field to work at embassies, and I'll be at one where this is going to be a high priority, what are some of the best practices that we can be sure to implement overseas on your behalf. Thank you. Uh, the first question about um, President Kani and uh, his appointment uh, for uh, sending a woman to Supreme Court uh, as the, um, an extraordinary decision that we have never had a woman in the Supreme Court of Afghanistan. This is a very turning point in the history of women uh, movement in Afghanistan. But um, unfortunately, we couldn't get enough vote for her in the parliament. Um, and there was a lot of factors. Uh, yes, we had 20 women absent that day. And we didn't have enough campaign among women that this is not just a, an appointee, this is an appointment for the history of women movement in the country. And unfortunately, we short some, some um, campaign for that. But beside of that, I think we need to send competent women in front for that Supreme Court nomination, because on that day, um, she couldn't campaign well, as well by herself. Uh, campaign in Parliament of Afghanistan is not an easy job. You have to talk with many groups even who are not in the parliament, even warlords who are s outside of the parliament, but they have their representatives there in the parliament from different ethnicity, different religion, different gender. So all these things have to be in, in, the, in your list for campaign. And another story from that day that she came to the parliament and she was giving a speech and we were so happy that today we are going to send a woman to the Supreme Court of Afghanistan. That was such a wonderful day for us. But unfortunately, we didn't get the result that we expect. She started uh, very well, but at the middle, because men was not so happy about uh, listening to her, they started talking the dumb stuff. And there was like a, a classroom full of the students who are talking to each other and not to the teacher. And she said, men and women, dear parliamentarians, I'm a um, 
professor in the university, and I keep quiet until you keep quiet. And this became uh, something that uh, they countered from within the, the hall. They said, we are not your students. And they started um, uh, rumors around themselves that this woman that just disrespect us. And, and that was the moment I was thinking she shouldn't say that. We needed to, uh, we needed, she needed her to be quiet. That was one of the reasons. But there was a lot of other factors. We, she needed to educate much more about what's going on in the parliament and the dynamic of the voting. But the good news is we talked with both President Ghani and, and Dr. Abdullah, CEO, that if 100 times they introduce and send a woman and she doesn't get enough vote, the 100 one time they have to send another woman. They shouldn't send a man instead of a woman. And until the day we get vote, they have to send that. They promised that. I hope they keep it. Um, we are in the Tunisian parliament at the moment in the process of implementing the uh, constitution, writing the organic law which will create the Supreme Court. So we were actually thinking even ourselves about this question. And a, a colleague MP did something great. She asked nobody because she knows very well how this kind of, you know, like plafond de verre, uh, we, which come when, when it's about, you know, like uh, um, um, occupying uh, higher positions in, in the Tunisian administration. She just waited for all the media to be in the commission, general legislation commission, and she just said, for the nominations, uh, I want to suggest parity because parity is in the constitution. So parity has to be here now every time you are thinking about sending any you know kind of people to occupy any kind of position in in the in the in the higher uh, uh, Tunisian administration. And I know that a lot of people, even from my party, were against, but they couldn't say anything because it was in front of the media, and nobody can now be like a kind of. Uh, uh, you know, conservative, or uh, as we say in, in Arabic, Raja is people. So they were just like waiting till we had an internal meeting and everybody exploding, like, how can you? And she is, she understands, she's, she's a great feminist. She's, she's kind of, you know, like radical feminist that knows that sometimes you need to impose things by law and that you can't wait, like, you know, waste, waste time, uh, you know, just talking and, and, and get into an agreement. And now we adopted it because uh, all the politicians they didn't want to explain, you know, that they were against it, and they didn't want to take this risk. And especially in a country where women vote a lot, I mean, uh, the population who is the most active in, in the turnout uh, during the elections are always women in Tunisia. So um, this is, you know, like a kind of way that you can do to not expect all the women to be always pro-women when it's about to choose someone. And I say it again. I think it's important. I don't think, you know, like uh, it's about being extraordinary or, you know, like uh, very, very competent because we have super good judges, men who are not doing that great and who are even doing bad. And uh, I mean, you know, we don't have only brilliant politicians who are at the head of ministries. So, I mean, you know, it's uh, this kind of narrative should be now normal for us. We we're not like, just expecting you know, generous women to, to be uh, uh, at, at these positions, but just like, you know, um, uh, you know, again, this, this average thing about us, I think it's, um, it, 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 it's working for us. Yeah. Sandra and Michelle, if you could respond to that the question she asked, and I think keeping in mind, I, I thought it was so interesting in Canada that we see yeah. half of a new government is women, and I loved his answer when asked why, and he yeah. said because it's 2015, I mean, it's obvious, right, that this, this makes sense. But I do think it's interesting recognizing that each country is different on its own path. What are the three things that we in the United States government, that others should be doing in these countries to try to support women who either who are interested in running for office or being more effective in office? I, I, I think the best practices are, um, you, you have to do your gender analysis. You need to understand the gender structures in the country. You need to understand the internal political structures. We have a great tool, Women with Women tool, that we roll out constantly to actually just apply it to the party structure and then have that thought. So there's a, there's a piece about analysis. Don't assume what you see is actually 
uh, going to allow you to understand the internal political and power structures in a country. So that's one thing. I think the other thing is, is work with demand and supply. So when we're looking at reform, we tend to focus on one institution alone, but we, our theory of change says you've got to work in three planes. You've got to work in the individual leadership capacity plane. You've got to work on the institutional plane, but you've also got to work on the sociocultural plane. So look at the gender norms and changing those. Um, and I think the third thing is really uh, stick with it. it you know, <laughs> none of this happens overnight. And I think that's something that as, as practitioners, as donors, it's a long-term investment we're making. And it's not always obvious that the investment has to be made in the political sphere. I think one of the things that um, uh, uh, Saida said earlier on was the long-term investment in women's education and equality and empowerment that went on prior to the, uh, the revolution has actually paid off. So, you know, th those, these are long-term change processes, and we need to have more patience to stick with them. I actually agree wholeheartedly with Sandra said, so maybe I'll touch on um, maybe what you specifically in an embassy um, can do. So I just came back from um, being in Tunisia, where I was IRI's RCD for Indonesia programming. And I thought the embassy there was doing such a great job on the gender issue. And one of the things they had, and again, I don't know if this is in every embassy, but they actually had a team that was dedicated to gender empowerment. It was fantastic. A couple things they did that I thought were really smart and I thought really beneficial was um, we had sort of an informal working group that would get together and it was sort of the kind of the US expat practitioners in the field of women's empowerment. So um, you know, I was there for Political, there was someone else there who worked on environment, someone on health, et cetera. And we would get together regularly because we, of course, were down in the roots on the ground working in the field. And we were able to have this conversation like, hey, you should be aware of this. These are some encroaching issues that we're seeing. It was a great dialogue. Um, and it also gave us all a support system. And the second thing is they had a really great sort of, um, like this, all of those smaller profile. The U.S. Embassy was really good under the DCM, who is Kristen Bauer, of doing women, sort of women in policy events. Never underestimate really the power of, you know, a country like the United States saying, hey, gender is important. These were always well attended by um, not only women, but men in the political sphere as well. It was just, again, giving this platform to say, hey, this is a really important topic. The last thing I would say, and this is really important, um, and especially in Indonesia, again, was a great example of this. It's a vast country, um, not only in population, but in geography. Get out to the provinces and the rural districts. One of the things, um, you know, I say all the time is we, understandably, and again, it goes back to not always having the research, the easiest snapshot we have when we look at women in politics is the national level. But where politics really, you know, um, is the most personal and direct is at the local levels. You see, and India is always an example we use of this, some powerful, really best practices happening, but they're always happening more out in the field at the local levels. And so having those relationships with, um, you know, maybe women's NGOs or, you know, women's political coalitions, I think will really give you a good sense for what really the temperature of the country is. I mean, then I just want to make clarification to something I said earlier um, on the study, which is really uh, interesting on the gender parity in the cabinets. Um, one of the, to clarify, one of the sort of criticisms by women's empowerment groups globally was under Bachelet, they didn't actually pass a gender quota for parliament. And she was president, but no gender quota ever came up. But the point was, the analysis was, you looked at how many gender sensitive laws had been passed. And when you sort of, you know, balance that too, I mean, it was like apples and oranges. So I think sometimes, again, we have to be very careful what sort of our benchmarks and our metrics are for women's empowerment. Um, thank you so much. This has been a really incredible uh, panel to, to listen to. My name is Joya. I work for Tostan, um, an organization headquartered in Senegal and working in six countries in West Africa currently. Uh, Molly Melching would have been loved to be here, but she just returned to Senegal actually. So uh, in your remarks in the beginning, Ambassador Russell, you mentioned wanting to know what's working on the ground and, and so what's happening in the field. And so I just have to share that, you know, we've, we've seen a significant number of women who've never had access to a formal education, who through our non-formal human 
human rights-based program have been running for and being elected into local offices um, and mayor's offices. And in fact, I just have to share that in Tambacunda, which is a really conservative region in southeastern Senegal, it, of the 55 communities that participated in our program, 61 uh, were elected into a local office, 40 of which were women. And we just discovered this and obviously are just very feeling very optimistic and giddy about it. And we're gonna be releasing a short film following one of these women. But so Michelle, you actually mentioned the human rights aspect. So women not necessarily even knowing that they have the right to vote. Um, and Sandra, you just mentioned two gender norms. So you know what we found is bringing folks together to have a human rights dialogue. So you're bringing men, women, you know, young and old, the gatekeepers, the religious leaders to talk about individual human rights, and we found that has had such incredible results. So I'm wondering if, if any of the panelists, and Michelle maybe in particular, in your programming, how you address the human rights aspect. Thank you. <clears throat> Good question and so many answers. Um, well, I'm gonna start with a story, and it reminds me of what you were saying. So one of the, um, uh, training products we had that we developed with the UN was, it's called the Women's Leadership School. And that was something we really wanted to, and we have showcased um, in, um, I believe it's eight countries now worldwide, but it was a curriculum designed to actually teach women at the basic level. So for instance, in Guatemala, we were working with ind indigenous women and women who are illiterate. So teaching them sort, you know, the basics, as I said earlier, what are your rights? You know, how do you get politically active if you want to? And one of the stories we have out of Cameroon, um, we're working in northern Cameroon, and you know these um, countries maybe even better than I, very tribal, very tribal. And so there was local elections coming up, and the women had come together, there was a strong women's movement, and they really wanted to get involved. Well, before this, mainly, of course, as in many countries, but um, it, it was always a male tribal leader was the mayor, and then maybe his son would come in next, and usually all men got elected. And so what our chapter did there is I said, we're gonna do this women's leadership school. And then what we're gonna do on the last day is once we've, it's an empowerment course, there's eight sections, and one of them is communications and talking with your elders, especially in a patriarchal community. We had the tribal leaders come in on the last day. It was just fantastic. And so the women you know, had been trained now for three days and they gave their little stump speech and who they were and why they wanted to be politically active. And it was really quiet at the end. And looking around and apparently the mayor said and they looked at he had brought a council member with him and he said that's it the boys in this community are so stupid did you see how smart these girls are we need to make sure every one of these girls is running for the local office they've been trained and it was just incredible but it was when we talked to the women they said well we never would meet with the male tribal leaders I mean that's not something we ever did and it was again just offering this opportunity for them to come together um, which was really incredible. But again, and then one last example in, in Zimbabwe, what happened and worked really well was when we had these women's leadership academies, uh, political academies, we actually worked together with the government to have someone from the appropriate bureau there, once we explained how to, um, why you should register to vote, actually sign them up to vote. So they actually left with a little voter ID card. And then we also had the political leaders from that district come in and talk about their political parties. And then afterward, um, and then we kind of put them on a spot and said, tell us what your party does for women. But we made them actually have that conversation and see all these bright, young, motivated women who wanted to be a part of it. Um, and again, that was something really interesting because a lot of these women sort of felt validated and empowered to actually be part of that movement. I think we would have similar sorts of programs. I think for us, um, there's two things. We have a very strong um, citizen participation and sort of CSO advocacy strengthening program. It, it's sort of classic and it's been going for years and we do a lot of that sort of work. I think w the other part of it though is to, to, to point to the fact that in a lot of the processes that we support now, if you're looking at it at an inclusion lens, you start thinking about these sorts of issues. Who, who gets excluded if you say, for example, that you can't be an electoral observer unless you've finished school um, you know, and got a school degree? I mean, like women in a whole lot of countries, because we know in a whole lot of countries, women don't do more than seven years of schooling. So, you know, it, it, it's the inclusion piece actually drives a lot of what we do. And as far as you can, uh, as I said, make sure that in our partnerships with uh, uh, CSO organizations, we hit, for the first time ever in Cote d'Ivoire, 40% of our partner domestic observer group were women. First time ever we've managed to do that. 
in sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. This is a big step uh, because um, once you've got the observers looking like the population, now you're starting to change that dynamic, and women are seeing themselves as part of, as you know, as these women have shown, as custodians of that democratic process and custodians of those rights. So I think that that you know is is it's a slightly different take, but yeah, we, we have stories too. I think we have time for one more question. Maybe two if you're really quick. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, good morning. I'm Gabriela Borowski. I'm the political participation policy specialist at UN Women, based in New York. Uh, thank you very much to Ambassador Russell, the State Department, and these amazing panelists for a really uh, empowering, frankly, uh, panel this morning. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, UN Women is, as always, a strong supporter and partner in this effort. Um, we have political participation programs in more than 60 countries around the world, um, uh, but women's participation in electoral processes is generally very high on the United Nations agenda, so we uh, hope to continue supporting and working together in partnerships to further this effort. Um, and linked very much to what uh, my colleague Sandra was just saying, um, and also Ambassador Russell mentioned in the beginning that beyond looking at women's participation in terms of political candidacy, uh, women as voters, um, electoral institutions are very much a part of this story. So I'm going to um, take advantage of the platform to, to let everybody know that, the, that UN Women and UNDP have jointly just produced this guide on uh, promoting um, uh, inclusion and gender equality inside electoral management bodies. Um, so, uh, looking uh, at the gender balance in terms of um, the administration and leadership inside uh, EMBs, uh, electoral observers and monitors, um, election administration workers, and making sure that that is something that is looked at it through the entire electoral process. Um, I did have one question, um, but rather than answering it right away, I'll let uh, my colleague here answer, and then perhaps they could be answered together. Um, and that is for our, our parliamentarians today. Um, and I was curious to know, um, we're talking a lot about, um, although there's been some mention of women's participation at the local level, we're talking a lot about the challenges in parliament. And I'm wondering what you see, in your opinion, in your countries as some of the particular challenges that women in local government are facing, um, how you've been able to interact with them, if at all, and support them, um, and where more work could be done in this area. Thank you. I promise I'll keep it uh, short. Uh, my name is Rafat Chakai. I'm actually an advisor on the US-Pakistan Women's Council, as well as the president of PAKPAC, which is a Pakistani-American political action committee. Um, I, I just want to make a general statement uh, with a little a small question. Uh, the statement is, that as we have heard the phrase, behind every successful man, there's a strong woman. So in this situation, behind every successful woman, there has to be a strong man. So my question is to both the parliamentarians, who were the role models and men in your life that encouraged you to be the way you are? Thank you so much. Well, um, so for, for, the, for the first question about local elections, um, you know, Tunisia is still in process of transition. I mean, it's not over. So one of the main challenge for us um, as the legislative uh, level is actually to um, work on the decentralization process, which is a whole chapter in the Constitution that Basically, we have a planning for the whole year. We have three organic laws. Um, there is one which will actually reorganize the whole territory, one which will uh, um, organize the hierarchy in terms of uh, responsibilities within the state from the central, uh, from the capital. We have a very French-oriented system, you know, like a centralized country um, to, to the west of, the, of, of the, the, the territory. And then the third one, which is the electoral uh, law for local elections.
restrictions. So here, I mean, we have, you know, again, these basic values of encouraging young people by, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, pushing political parties to nominate young people there, uh, and the condition is that they get back the uh, public, you know, part of the uh, uh, financing of the campaign if they put more than 30% of young people in, you know, eligible places, basically the first one in the list, and the parity is not something that we're gonna discuss because it's a constitutional right. Um, and then, we work in very much with NDI, I have to say, uh, uh, who uh, already started, uh, you know, this um, training programs to encourage women, and especially young women, to uh, uh, go forward and to go to political parties to occupy, you know, the space. This is how men do. do. It's just like they are always at the HQ of the local branch of the political party, so there are so much there that at some points, you know, they just decide to put them on the list. So we try, you know, like to push women to also be physically present uh, in the in the places, the very places where the lists are actually decided and, and constituted. Our party, we decided actually uh, to put a minimum quota uh, for women inside the uh, uh, internal uh, um, institution of our party. So there will be more women in our next Congress uh, uh, of the party who will decide, you know, uh, uh, for the list. So we hope very much that this will also uh, kind of push more women to be there, to be present, and also to head lists, not only to be, you know, part of it, but to be at the top of uh, the campaign. And um, so we, we're moving here, uh, and 30th of October is basically the deadline for all the legislative process to be ready, for all the political parties to be ready, and then we will have the office uh, launch of the uh, local elections. Regarding your question, I, I do agree with you. I mean, it's important uh, to, to have men who support you, but maybe, this is, this is very personal, uh, but I think more and more that uh, we should start or as well just, you know, accepting the fact that a woman uh, can be a politician and not be married and not have children and not be, you know, like, just, you know, pressured about all this maternal uh, wife, uh, sister thing, uh, and just, you know, like, just to be taken as an individual. So I think it's also part of the struggle. Uh, but, um, um, you know, from my, 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 own, my own experience, uh, my dad is an imam, so he kind of, like, got this religious, you know, uh, authority that every time someone comes to challenge my presence in the public space through a religious perspective, you know, like, I have one of the best, like, advocator for that. <laughs> See what I mean? So, um, yeah, and I think, you know, more and more that in, in, in society, well, the U.S. is also a very religious society, but, I mean, in our societies, in, in Tunisia, where religion is something important for people, it's a kind of, like, moral values are, are important for people, and uh, most of them are rooted, you know, from, from Islam. Um, it, it's important that we also kind of develop a discourse to say, no, I mean, Islam is not against it. You're just a macho, you know, it's not has nothing to do with religion. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, about the UN women, you mentioned um, uh, your mission, but in Afghanistan, in the hallway, outside of the, uh, the hall of parliament, uh, there is a center of UN women, uh, which is a resource center for women. And they have an advisor and also some compu computer that you can print things that you want, you can ask from that advisor anything that you want, that uh, he will help you about the background of an issue that you can bring to the hall. And that's very helpful. Uh, besides of that, uh, one day I was sitting there and a man came, a, a male co uh, colleague came and said, I need a copy. And I said, did you see that? This is just for women. And <laughs> It's not a male um, resource center, a women resource center. And he said, I really need that. Could you please do I said, okay, I will ask the, the lady to uh, print that for you, but you have to vote to the uh, agenda that we have today about. <laughs> and he said, I'll definitely do that. Uh, and he did. I saw his card. It was yeah, uh, so that's uh, something that I wanted to share with you, and this is a UN Women um, Center that we really um, 
get advantage of it. Um, the, t the next thing about the local um, office, uh, in Afghanistan we have um, local provincial shuras or uh, the provincial parliaments. Um, in Afghanistan, ac actually, we have also electoral law that uh, get uh, go, uh, that uh, we have quota for women out there. But in the election, uh, electoral uh, reform um, and electoral amendments, actually, a group of parliamentarians who were men, they just removed all the quota for women, and they said that women can come to this provincial shura, but we don't give them quota. It was a long way to bring that 25% again to 20%, but happily we could get that 20% back, and now we have women in provincial shura. But uh, it was like, just for a click and a glance, all the things that you had for 10 years, all those women that we had for 10 years in provincial shura that they were representing the local issues, we just lost them. And if we couldn't get that 20% back, we wouldn't have women in provincial shuras of all around the country of Afghanistan. And uh, you, regarding your question, uh, I act that behind every successful man there is a woman, and behind every successful woman there is a man. But I choose my role models not based on gen gender, but based on their accomplishments, their values. And I have many role models. Uh, if you look to the history of the United States, one of them is uh, Ms. Hillary Clinton. And uh, if you look to the history of the world, it's Nelson Mandela. If you, uh, you look to the history of um, South, South Asia, it's Gandhi. And all these people are role models for me because they fought for justice and equality. And we need that in our society. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for those comments. I think that's a good way to end. I'd like to make two really quick points to Sandra and to Michelle. First, thank you so much for the work that you do, for your or the work that your organizations do. I think one of the things that we would like to do from our office is really think about how, and this addresses one of the points that somebody made about the, our embassies, is how maybe putting together a, a, a pretty simple toolkit, and I think maybe with the help of UN Women, who is an amazing partner to us in so many ways, but to say really this is what we should be trying to do on the ground in a pretty simple way, and so I would appreciate if you'd be willing to work with Stephanie. I know everybody here knows Stephanie Foster, who's a hero in this world, but I think it would be helpful if you would be, if you'd be able to do that. Um, and to Saida and Nahid, I mean, what can we say? You're both amazing, and you give all of us hope and optimism about the future, and you give us sort of renewed commitment to supporting women all around the world, because we see how amazing even such young women are, and how the f futures of your countries really are on your shoulders, not to put too much pressure on you, but I think you're well up to the challenge, and I thank you so much for being here today and for all the work you do. Thank you all for coming.